but uh, well, a little bit. So, so I'll just tell you a little bit. I, I can't even tell you how much this tickles me because I really just this has happened in a couple places. I just put the site up, and to have you guys actually show up and invite me into this space means a lot to me because I know that the uh, historical society isn't even technically open at, at these hours. So, the, the Herald Leader article kind of changed what I ex thought I was going to be doing, to be quite honest, because I, writers come through Kentucky and they kind of go to Lexington, Louisville, maybe they stop down in Bowling Green and then they're, they're gone. They go down to Nashville, make their way to Square Books in, in uh, Oxford. And, uh, and to me that seems like you're missing all, this, all these places. And so the tour idea a little bit was like if you're going to write about Kentucky, and a lot about Kentucky that I don't know. For example, Ohio County. I'm sure that I've come through here, but I can't tell you that I have this moment where I know that I was in Ohio County and did a specific thing. I just know that my mom, she took me a lot of road trips growing up, and so that's kind of what this book came out of. And uh, so I said, if you're going to go write through research or through books about these places, well, you better make sure that you also put your feet in these places. It's a, sort of like an intention. And, uh, and I could manage 28 days away from my life because I, I have a kid. So I brought her for the first week, the poor kid. I was traveling around with her and she's miserable. And she was just like, why are we still driving to all these places? And it's just like, here's your iPad, please. Um, and then, uh, and then, this, and then my, I sent my mother back with her for the next week to help out my wife who works in Portland. So I, so, I, so I had 28 days and I just did one of those old like AAA triptych sort of things as best I could. I've been running late to some places. You, you we're here early in the morning, so I'm good. And, now I'll run over and get behind, and and, uh, and it'll all fall apart by the end of the day. But um, but that sort of like was the idea for the, this tour, which is just the, the people don't come through all the counties of uh, of Kentucky, and I couldn't honestly say that I'd been to every county in Kentucky. And at the least, at the end of this trip, I will be able to, to to say that. My intention was really just one to be like, it is proper to go to these places and read if you're going to write about them. That, that, that somehow that is a right thing to do. I don't know that, I, you know, I'm not saying it's morally wrong not to, it just seems like the proper intention. Um, what has been so great and surprising about the tour idea is this, is just meeting people in each place and meeting Kentuckians. So I thought it was gonna be, what was gonna be great about it was seeing all of these places and kind of having my own kind of epic road trip where I could go to, you know, overlooks down in southeastern Kentucky and then kind of do this nice drive on, county roads through the knobs and and see these parts of the state and, and, and I thought it was going to be kind of a sh selfish trip and then uh, what's been really lovely about it is every once in a while for example in like Scott County the day after that article came out people started to show up at these side of the road things and I was I before I left I said if one person shows up at some event that I've just kind of thrown on my website it'll make the whole trip worthwhile well then all of a sudden people started showing up so I was on top of High Bridge reading on the train tracks over the high bridge and kind of filming it like like y'all like are here and uh, this guy waved me down and I scrambled down the bank and I met Doug McLaren and his wife Mary and I was like boy that's crazy that happened and then I get to get Garrett County next to the Cary uh, Nation House which isn't a historical site it's on private property um, and two little like two two older ladies in a bugs show up down these county roads. I mean, you really gotta go down a couple of county roads to get there. And uh, and then I was like, well, this is crazy too. Then another couple of people showed up and it changed everything. And it was always this wonderful moment. And then at that Carrier Nation house, the, the owner of the house came up and that was the first time. He was kind of a good old boy, he's like 80. His name was Junior Drew and he was driving kind of an old rickety truck. And I was like, well, this is the first time someone's gonna ask me to, to get off their land. It was just a totally great request. I'd be like, yes, sir, thank you. Sorry for the intrusion. But instead what happened was he, he realized the Cary Nation House, ironically enough, has become a place in Garrett, for youth in Garrett County to get drunk. They go up there, and who knows what else, but they go up there and it's kind of, a, the, the house is in disrepair. And it's become junior sort of, he, he keeps storage there, he keeps a lot of tires and he keeps a lot of old air conditioning units and things like that within the house. And so the youth go in and they break in and they drink there and they leave broken bottles and someone's going to light a cigarette and, and burn the place down is what's really going to happen to it. And so, but the, what happened was he came up and he realized that I wasn't a teenager there to get drunk or mess up his property and instead he walked me through the property and instead of telling the story of Carrier Nation, he told me the story of the Drew family 
moving there, get, getting the property in 1942, and then his 12 brothers and sisters, or 13 if you count the one that died in infancy, and where they lived, and he would go and he'd be like, right after I got married, we stayed in that room, you know. And all I got at Carrie Nation was like, she was probably born back here in the old part of the house. And then he'd be like, but my daddy redid the, you know, and he would kind of tell the story. And so, it's just my way of saying it's been kind of lovely in each place meeting people because then the stories that I've only kind of looked at through books, right, come a little bit more more alive. Even sitting down with you guys and being like, Tishners are still here and they're common and if we went to the cemetery right now, it'd be, you know, full of them, you know? Um, and uh, so, so that was one project, that sort of tour idea. And then the book itself, Sometimes when they write, I, sometimes I almost apologize for it when I meet people because I do say I'm not a proper historian. It's not a good Kentucky history book, and and it's not always a book that's very positive about. It, it's not, like I had said a little bit earlier, it's not uh, every section of it isn't positive. It's kind of. I had left Kentucky, and I couldn't have gotten out of here fast. The only reason I studied in school is because I wanted to leave Kentucky, and then I went to Ohio, then I went to Iowa. And I moved to Costa Rica and tried to teach and do like, you know, nonprofit work down there for a while. And then I ended up in New York. And then I ended up in Texas, Central Texas. And then I ended up in Houston, Texas. And then my wife got a job in Portland, Oregon, and I followed her out and got a job as well. And all of a sudden I was in my mid thirties and I really missed Kentucky. And my, my parents and my sister live on adjoining properties and my daughter's cousins are here and um and I wanted to move back, so I, so I just started to explore what that is. Because how, because when you go, when you leave Kentucky, everyone, you meet these other Kentuckians and they're, you guys have a bond because you're Kentuckians. But what's that mean, right? Like, the, like the reason we ask each other, what county are you? You either say, I'm from Lexington, Louisville, or I'm from, and then county, right? Everyone else is not from Lexington. And I'm from Lexington. That means something. It's, you, can, you can say what it means about me, and there's certain <laughs> stereotypes that probably fit, right? Like... An urban kid, right? Uh, probably a pretty terrible hunter, you know? Uh, uh, and then each county has its own sort of, <coughs> sort of like personality and means something to, to be from that place. So I started to write about it as a way to actually try to understand Kentucky better. Because I realized I was homesick for this place and I didn't know enough about it. I didn't know enough about its totality from like, you know, the eastern portion gets so romanticized, and central Kentucky has its kind of opulence and horses, and it gets sort of romanticized. Western Kentucky gets kind of totally forgotten about in a lot of ways, right, in terms of the stories that get told outside of Kentucky. And I think that's unfortunate in, in a lot of ways, too. Its culture, its culture is different, as best I can tell, and unique, and I'm still learning it, right? But it doesn't get as, like, told out there in the world, you know? And so... So in a lot of ways, it was a way to kind of better understand the, his, the, the totality of the history of this state to a, to a certain degree. Um, and then the tour is the act of, of trying to put my feet in all of those places as well and, and understand it even on a more personal or soil level. Wendell Berry has this thing that's just like, look down at, you know, if you want to know, like look down at your feet, I think. It's like, look down at the soil. Like if you want to know what you stand for, it's what you stand on, right? And so this act of putting your feet in, in, in a location and kind of, I don't know, to some degree paying a reverence or, and, and the people who have been there a reverence is, is important. Um, I'll read these like three, three sections. So, so the book works and sort of runs. So the way it works is like if I'm in a county, I have to make a little reference to that county. But the story that I'm telling is really about my own life to, in, in Portland, Oregon, and being homesick. I don't know, have you yeah. managed to start some of it? Is that a pretty good description? Yeah. Of it? Okay. Um, so I'll read Muhlenberg, Ohio, in the center, and then J Jesmond County. And so they're basically, it follows the order, so it's Jefferson to McCreary. Um, and so, it, you know, the, the dates of ratification. So that's kind of the structure that I have to fit to. I can't change around the counties. Although there's a lot of debate about which county was established when, especially when there's a bunch during one particular year. So mm -hmm. I did the best I could with land management records from the Secretary of State, but they, they, some of them conflict, to be quite honest with you. Um, so Muhlenberg County, 1799. The summer after they married, Wendell Berry asked his wife to nest with him in a cabin along the Kentucky River. For me, Berry wrote, that was a happy return. For Tanya, who was hardly a country girl, it was a new kind of place, confronting her with hardships she could not have expected. 
I wonder if Tanya, who was born in California, dreamed of cities and oceans that summer. If she woke up resenting the muted greens and browns outside her door. I wonder often how she, if she doubted the man she'd married. I have to imagine Mitchell Berry's life has been filled with disappointment. When the seas overtake the land and the air is too thick to breathe, his words might haunt us. And yet the place he calls home, um, this is a little bit political, and I apologize if this goes against someone's politics, and I'm happy to talk about it, just to be fair warning a little bit. Because usually the book is not terribly political, but it gets a little political here. <coughs> and yet the place he calls home blows the tops off its mountains and gives power plants names like paradise. Except for in Atanya, where does a man find satisfaction when the world around him is turning to dust? And some of that was to also pay homage to, I think, what Barry is... is is calling out in terms of his environmental policies and paying reverence to at least his thought, which is much deeper than my own on the, on the matters. Ohio County, 1799. For months, thoughts about Kentucky have consumed me. Outside, summer is ending and the cosmos are going to seed. Each day I think about how I should cut them back and prepare the garden for fall, but I don't. In front of me, the jade tree that decorated our wedding table is dying from rot. Leaves fall off each time someone bumps the table. We sheltered the jade on our journey to Oregon, made it a symbol of our love. The book is an address to my wife. It sat between us while we drove into setting suns. We hid it in the bushes that flanked our roadside hotels to give it fresh air. And when the temperature dipped, we carried it into the warmth of rented rooms. The plant is dying at this point in the book. Um, today I trimmed the worst of the rot away and repotted what was left, but still the jade withers. Even if I had a bottle of Dr. Titchener's cure-all, I doubt it would recover. The plant is too far gone to save, and I can't help but feel responsible for its slow decline. A man can lose himself to such wandering thoughts. Uh, and then maybe one more here. Jesmond County. Uh, Daniel Boone is rumored to have said, I can't as ever say I was, I can't say as ever I was lost, but I was bewildered once for three days. I love that. I love that. I love that. I make no similar claim. I am more often bewildered than not. And lost. I spend hours trying to make sense of how Boone ended up living out his days in Defiance, Missouri. Come up empty. I know the details. The facts. Debts he couldn't pay. No offense, judge. An overzealous judge. And a puffed up sheriff. The fact that, according to his biographer, Boone lacked the ruthless instincts that speculation demanded, which I only consider one further reason to commend the man. I am also aware that the same year politicians chased Boone across the border, Kentucky named a county in his honor, and that some might call this ironic. But facts don't always tell a story. They don't bridge that gap, that gap between narrative and meaning. The Kentucky Boone knew changed so much during his lifetime. By the time he left, there were more high roads and high bridges, but far fewer high-minded men. And the Buffalo Boone had found on his arrival, they had vanished forever. Um, those are kind of funny sections for me to read a little bit. Uh, I, I, you know, there's, there's sections in those that I'm kind of looked back and I'm kind of like, I don't know if I'm at my best in certain sections there. I think I'm trying to move the story a along a little bit. That jade is this recurring image, so the section on Ohio County, that's, that's where you're seeing that. And, and what it really was, was he had to do these, he makes symbols of things, right? So for, for my wife and I, that jade was on our wedding table, and so it was a symbol of our marriage. And here I am, I'm trying to convince her to move to Kentucky, and this jade that we've had for years, it's six years, it's just dying. And a jade plant isn't a hard plant to keep alive. You know, the only way you can do it is overwatering it, probably. Um, and so that started to become a big symbol for me. And so that, in that Ohio County section, that's where the Dr. Tishner reference comes in to, 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 to be a cure-all. And that's kind of the book, is looking for ways to take my own personal sort of thoughts on homesickness or life in Oregon and trying to get my wife to move back to Kentucky and mixing it with s some sort of um, information or fact or myth or story about that county and that place and finding where the, where I can find some connection or in, intersection. Um, in a way, it's kind of like reaching out and trying to grab onto this place and kind of pull it into my own life a little bit. And uh, that was kind of the, the process of it. And the book, if it's like, if, it, if it's two parts or kind of like, 
exploration of Kentucky and the counties and exploration of my own homesickness and life in Oregon, the shift of the book goes more towards Oregon the longer it happens because my wife became pregnant at the time. And so I realized that my daughter, who was born in Portland, Oregon, she, she recently got on a plane and she said, I'm going home, you know, and that her home was going to be different from mine. It, the book comes up a little bit because I think we're told in a way that Horatio Alger story, like go out and follow your career path and wherever it takes you. And people move for their jobs a lot now. And I've started to wonder in my own life if that's the, that if we should value that as highly as we do, or at least as I was told growing up. You know, that's what I was told, like go out, go follow, go explore, advance in a career and go wherever it takes you. And that's what I've done. And then I come home at the end of the day and it's me and my wife in Portland, Oregon where we don't know anyone and people are kind of stoic out there. They're not quite as, you ask them a question and they'll answer in like a grump, you know, mm, you know, and then they don't say anything. It's very different from here. If you ask someone a question here, they'll tell you a story. If you ask them too many questions, they'll tell you their story all the way back to 1800, you know, <laughs> just wonderful. You know, other places aren't like that. And so... We, I started, we just feel very isolated out there a lot of times and, we, and miss people and, uh, and I miss the landscape and miss the people here. And uh, anyway, I, it's, it, it's, it's kind of, I've just started to rethink if the value of what we should be doing is telling people to move away in some ways from their ancestral lands and their kinfolk and their clans, you know, or whether or not those are the bonds that matter in this life, you know. Um, I especially see it when my when my daughter was back playing with her cousins and I was like, boy, I wish this was I wish this was our life, you know. Because it's not at home. She just has us sitting there, you know, bothering her. Um, anyway, I, so I, and I don't know that that, that that doesn't mean that people shouldn't get out and go explore. You know, it doesn't, I, there's not an easy answer to it. It's just, I just feel like I was told so much that, that one, that one side of it and I never thought about the repercussions of getting older and being away from the people you love and the places that you love and that you'd feel sort of like so rootless. I think, um, if you don't mind me asking, uh, you're a veteran, sir? Yes. So a lot of the studies of homesickness are studies of military because they both have to move quite often um, from base to base and they are nomadic or rootless a lot of times that life is, but also serving overseas especially the young soldiers, a lot of the studies of homesickness are done through, uh, through veterans and, and also college students, especially immigrant college students coming to America for some. So that's like, so that's kind of where a lot of the studies happen. And, and uh, an interesting thing to me was that homesickness was originally considered, or uh, nostalgia was originally considered a physical disease. And that being away from home sapped your sapped your energy and caused your pallor to fade and caused all this illness and and uh, it was it, it came that way because a Swiss medical student had some his name was Johannes Hofer and he had these two uh, patients who were living away from home for the first time and he sent them back to their homes to die he said I don't know what's wrong with you I don't know I don't know why you're why you're sick and they were dying and he sent them back home and they recovered. And so then he kind of started that study and that term nostalgia. But then what happened was the Swiss were these mercenary fighters. So that's why all that study happens at the, at the time. So if you wanted to win a war in Europe, you went and you got Swiss soldiers. And, and they would move and they'd go all over and, um, all over Europe. And then they would become this case, case study for, for homesickness. Then the Civil War happened here in America. And people at that time had been nostalgic or homesick for Europe and for the places they, they come from. After the Civil War, Emerson comes in and he says, place is nothing, advance on. And that becomes that whole movement of don't, don't tie yourself to the land. And it was harder to tie yourself to the land because you had just fought a really terrible war on that land, right? And you had gone against your kin in some, in, in some cases. And so people started to attach themselves less with home. And that idea of nostalgia or homesickness became seen as a mental condition, like a, like closer to like being a manic depressive or anxiety-ridden person. It became a mental deficiency almost to be homesick or to long for things. And uh, I was interested in that because I also felt very weak in my own life in Portland, Oregon, for wanting to return home to, to for being selfish and wanting to take my wife who did not want to return to Kentucky and be like, let's, let's return back. 
there seemed to be a selfish sort of impulse in that a little bit too that I, wa that I wanted to explore. So even that idea of homesickness is explored a little bit in the book and I just found the, the way that people tried to understand it very, very interesting. In the 19th century, a lot of times when people committed suicide, it was attributed to um, homesickness. Um, regardless of what the reasons were. That was just because it was a weak mental condition mm -hmm. that it was, it was that. Um, and there's still people studying it, but 